Dr. Simon Mary Asese Ayokai was born in Nigeria. He received his undergraduate education in philosophy at the Spiritan School of Philosophy in Nigeria in 1997. He began his initial studies in theology at the Spiritan International School of Theology before migrating to the United States to continue it at St. John Seminary, Camarillo, California. He earned a graduate degree in theology with a focus in medical ethics in 2007. He obtained his PhD in systematic theology from Duquesne University in 2013. Dr. Ayokai is currently an assistant professor of systematic theology at the University of Portland. He is the coordinator of the university's Theology Thursday Lecture Series. He has worked extensively with communities at the margins in Nigeria and in the United States of America. He has held academic positions at Loyola Marymount University, Valparaiso University, and St. Leo University. As a product of a multiple context, he is he is intentional at creating spaces for multiple perspectives in his research and teaching. His research focuses on religion and identity, African approaches to ethics, African philosophies, cultures, and theologies, religion and violence, comparative theology, themes in systematic theology, and interfaith studies. Among his many works published include a monograph titled Fostering Interreligious Encounters in Pluralist Society, Hospitality and Friendship, an edited volume, 10 book chapters, and 20 peer-reviewed articles in reputable journals. His works have been published by Rutledge, Palgrave Macmillan, Pauline Press, Oxford University Press, Cambridge Scholars Press, and several peer-reviewed national and international journals. His next book explores the contribution of women of color to the women's suffrage movement. Dr. Ayakai will gladly tell you that at the heart of all that he does as a theologian is to create space for God's life to be experienced by all in our world. At his leisure time, he can be found playing with his blind Siberian husky named Hope. It is my honor to introduce to you the 2020 Tolton lecturer, Dr. Simon Mary Ayakai. Thank you very much. It is an honor to be with you this evening. I think I consider it a great uh, moment opportunity, and uh, I'm so glad that Chicago is not snowing this time. <laughs> I prepared and dressed like I was going to Siberia, and then I got to like, oh, it's sunny. <laughs> okay, we stand on the shoulders of holy men and women in our church, and among them is Venerable Augustus Tolton. Uh, as I have been joking, I gave my title, the title of my paper is almost a paragraph long. <laughs> I said that maybe I'm a German in disguise, you just don't know. <laughs> so I said, the title of my uh, lecture today is Rethinking Eschatology in an Era of Systemic Evil Towards a Theology of Human Oldness, Reflections on the Life of Reverend Augustus Tolton. The content of Christian hope makes present to the Christian conscience the demands of liberation. It is an indictment of all agents and systems that erase wholeness from all that God has made in God's goodness. For the human community, eschatological hope forces the Christian gaze to focus on the human condition with radical openness to whatever the gaze may reveal. Without such openness and collective or individual critique, the content of Christian eschatological hope has no credibility. One cannot but side with Jogging Motman when he makes the claim that the God of the poor 
the peasant and the slave has always been the poor, suffering unprotected Christ, whereas the god of empires and rulers has usually been the Pantocrator, Christ enthroned in heaven. In light of this, the vision of holistic humanity must necessarily attest not to power dynamics in the workings of God in the world, but in divine solidarity with all who are held captive by the structures of evil in our world, both victimizers and victims themselves. I begin this lecture with a commitment to explore three movements that radically define my stance on rethinking eschatology in an era of systemic evil. One that makes a case for a theology of human wholeness in the concreteness of our embodiment. The first movement will explore how Christian eschatological hope opens up a new horizon that sheds light on the content of history. Here, History is to be understood as the concrete encounters of living bodies within their social, cultural, political, religious, and ideological locations. The second movement showcases how the realization of the content of eschatology is dependent on being actively engaged with the nowness of our lives as webs of relationships in a world that cries out for justice. This realization demands of us that we constantly engage the question, what does it mean to be human in God's world? The final movement creates the space where we ought to allow ourselves to hear the stories and hopes of the silenced voices and encounter the erased bodies of persons structures of oppression have kept in the ghettos of history. Their voices and experiences must be allowed to speak difficult truths that the beneficiaries of such structures may find discomforting. In doing this, and we conclude by reflecting on the life and witnessing of Venerable Augustus Tolton for our times. Christian Eschatological Hope, a Pathway for Rethinking History, is the title of the first movement. At the core of the founding of the political territory called the United States of America is the, ideology, is the ideology of preference and preference for whiteness. It is not simply a preference, rather, it is a system that continues to replicate itself in ways that whiteness constantly has the privileged locus of being in society. As Charles W. Mills notes, while shedding light on the racialized dynamics shaping American economic system, and I quote, racial exploitation is manifest in many more economic relations than just that of wage labor, unquote. <coughs> Derald Wing Sewell supports this claim when he asserts that no one born and raised in the United States is immune from inheriting the racial bias of their forebears. In other words, due to a racialized socialization process, all people are exposed to a racial curriculum that imbues in them biases, prejudices, and misinformation related to race. One can conclude that whiteness is both the driving force shaping all aspects of life in American society and an enduring blind spot that holds its beneficiaries captive in ways that its dehumanizing effect is not always noticed by its victims. This latter point has been stressed by theologians like Mary Elizabeth Hogbogood, who argues that there is a close link between disempowerment and overprivilege of white persons. She argues that racism emanates from and is perpetuated by the disability of whites to be authentically self-loving. In a society that rejects basic human needs and attributes, racism is the projection of white self-alienation. Stated strongly, whiteness as a mode of being in the world originates and operates from an existential stance that sees the world through the lens of scarcity. At the core of capitalism, is the philosophical principle that presents a world defined by limited resources. To ensure that whites 
As a social cultural group survives, strategies of exploitation of resources ought to be embraced, even at the expense of all that is not white. Such thinking always erases differences because that which is different is a threat to its interest. Any social, economic, political, cultural, religious, and epistemological relation that originates from such positioning in the world between whiteness and difference will always be reduced to what Martin Buber terms the I eat relation. Whenever the other is encountered as an eat, the subject, whether individual or community, always stands in a place of power and domination over the other. These power dynamics that always tends to lead to erasure of the other can be found also in Western epistemological and hermeneutic traditions. What is considered right knowledge and the very means for the production of knowledge are themselves held hostage by the grand agenda of whiteness. The demand for normativity is one that instantiates whiteness. In light of this, and walking in the shoes of Franz Fanon, Nelson Maldonado Torres articulates the functioning of whiteness as a colonial positionality via coloniality of being, coloniality of power, and coloniality of knowledge. In his words, I quote, colonial relations of power left profound marks not only in the areas of authority, sexuality, knowledge, and the economy, but on the general understanding of being as well. Invisibility and dehumanization are the primary expressions of the coloniality of being. The coloniality of being becomes concrete in the appearance of liminal subjects, which mark, as it were, the limit of being, that is, the point at which being distorts meaning and evidence to the point of dehumanization. The coloniality of being produces the ontological colonial racial difference, deploying a series of fundamental existential characteristics and symbolic realities." Unquote. At this point of this lecture, it is important I pose a question that will help us understand how this process of erasure that whiteness instantiates on a global context. What type of humanity is encountered via the embrace of whiteness as a mode of being in the world? To answer this question correctly, I turn to the sociologist, Boaventura de Sousa Santos, speaking to the global North epistemological hegemony that primarily favors whiteness, he writes, I quote, the epistemologies of the North are grounded in the idea of the rational subject, a subject that is epistemic rather than concrete or empirical, unquote. In other words, global North hegemony preferences an anthropology that is rich, arid, conscious of its lacks, and driven by the desire to want to acquire, be it utilitarian knowledge, material, or natural resources. In the global north dynamics, to speak of whiteness is to speak of cognitive postulations that do not reflect the concrete historicities of the person, either as an individual or as a community of persons. There is a bias for the abstract representation of being, and a rush to present the complex human stories as single stories that serve the grand agenda of whiteness, the unrestricted embrace of individualism, be it of the individual or of an ethnic group. Consequently, the epistemological heritage of the global north speaks in terms and concepts such as self-proclaimed universal concepts of reason, rationality, human nature, and human mind. All that does not fit such a concept is irrationality, superstition, primitivism, mysticism, prelogical thinking, and emotivism. In this way of thinking, difference is seen as problematic. The ability to hold complex narratives in place and resisting the desire to reduce them to simple linear narratives is lacking. 
Grandiose statements of the other are usually made as though they are dogmatic revelations that defy any form of empirical critique. Such epistemological arrogance translates itself into normative dualisms, such as truth falsity or knowledge opinion. Whatever does not fit the premise is imputed to falsity or opinion. In other words, when one looks at the epistemological arrogance of the global north, one notices that there is a correlation between this form of posturing and the structures of evil that instantiate whiteness as a mode of being in the world. The content of eschatological hope evokes a disruption that Christians cannot ignore. Eschatology speaks of a new way of being human in God's world, one of saturation of existence, where existence is not defined by the ideology of scarcity. Encounters with the world, with God, and with oneself are always iconic encounters that make life fully experienced without limitations. The promise of Jesus contained in the Johannine Gospel is thus realized, abundant life, John 10.10. 10. This vision of life disrupts our current existence where we are tempted to want to settle for an existence defined by individualism. It challenges expressions of individualism manifested in our social interactions economic systems that operate with the intent to exploit the vulnerable, political systems that divide humans into camps that breed ideological hatred, religious worlds of competition as though God needs us to fight God's wars in God's world, and cultures of waste, materialism and consumerism that continue to lead to the destruction of the environment. Reimagining human embodiment within the sphere of eschatology. We live in an age of doubt, one first ushered in by the Carthesian doubt. As Anna Arendt rightly puts it, I quote her, the astounding characteristic of Carthesian doubt is its universal universality that nothing, no thought, and no experience can escape it, unquote. Shedding light on its universality, Arendt makes the point of how this form of doubt has produced two nightmares that continue to radically define our world and existence. The first is the doubt that defines the reality of the world as well as of human life. The other concerns the, hum the general human condition. Though Arendt does not spell this out, Cartesian doubt creates the possibility and the coloniality of power that allows for the gaze of whiteness to strip the inherent dignities of the universe and of the human person. When one studies closely the emergence of European imperialistic ambitions in the area of industrialization, one notices that there is a close connection between the Cartesian cogito ergo sum, I think therefore I am, a thinking process that reduces the given inherent in the otherness of the universe to the biased conclusions of the subject. Subject is here understood to be agents or systems of imperialism, and these include the actual production of knowledge and recognition of knowledge, the recognition of the contours of history, the reimagination of the economic order, moving away from European feudalism into the European era of exploit, exploration and exploitation that culminated in the following, the transatlantic slave trade, the era of colonialism, neocolonialism, and the capitalist system operative even to this day that has gone on steroid. <laughs> the Cartesian gaze that is synonymous to whiteness as an operating principle in the world is inherently dualistic. It makes the order into a new reality that is radically defined by its interests and agenda. The philosophical conclusions of Immanuel Kant on the racial superiority of whites and the inferiority of blacks in his work on the different human races gives validity to the operative power of the Cartesian doubt 
to deny the other to be an active agent in giving voice to their histories and meanings. What justifies Kant's racial biases, if not the colonizing gaze of the European powers of the time? The Prussian anthropologists, who also served as agents of the colonial ambitions of their nation, could not but see the objects of their country's economic exploitation present in the lands and people of Namibia, Togoland, Cameroon, Middle Belt region of present-day Nigeria, and so on. An otherness that cannot mediate the discourses of its own historicities and identities. One sees the enthronement of the power to erase the other in the insights of George Hegel. Hegel presents the Geist, the national spirit, as the foundational hermeneutic lens for reading history. Consequently, it is not surprising that the European colonial agendas in Africa, Asia, Oceania, and the Americas produce results that reduce the peoples and cultures of these lands to such labels of uncivilized savages in need of European civilization. Mark Murphy, in his review of the work, The Structure of Social Theory, by Anthony King, calls attention to the Hegelian Geist as a way of speaking of German culture. Hegelian Geist is not, I quote him, an individual mind or spirit. It referred to individual cognition of the world nor to the, cat to the categories which underlay that individual cognition. For Hegel, individual perception was in fact dependent upon the pre-existing Geist. Geist referred broadly to the consciousness of a people of itself and the world in which they lived. It referred to a people's self-understanding. It denotes the practices which a people regard as appropriate. The kind of social intercourse in which that people engaged, and finally, the kind of world there was for that people." Unquote. With this understanding, one is compelled to ask the question, how did the most advanced society in Europe conceive of itself within the hermeneutic and cultural framework of Hegelian Geist and its position in the global politics of the 1800s and 1900s? The categorization and weaponization of race as an identity marker by German scholars of this era, along with its role in defining the imperial and colonial ambitions of European powers in other continents and regions of the world, speaks of a gaze that is intended to diminish the other at the expense of the profit of the subject. Mm -hmm. yeah. On another note, in his book, American Hate, Arjun Singh Sethi creates the much needed space for victims of hateful acts in America to tell their stories. Such stories reveal how non-white bodies are seen as a threat to the ambitions and agenda of white bodies who have embraced the white supremacist ideology of hate. Fanon, while reflecting on the, li on the lived experience of the black man, critiques the Hegelian ontology that speaks of being for the other on the grounds that the agenda of the Cartesian subject is to deny the relevance of the lived experiences of blacks in his discourse on ontology. As a result of this, Fanon concludes that, I quote him, the black man or, and woman has no ontological resistance in the eyes of the white man from one day to the next, the blacks have to heal, to deal with two systems of reference. Their metaphysics, or less pretentiously, their customs and the agencies to which they refer, were abolished because they were in contradiction with a new civilization that imposed its own." Unquote. For Fanon, the Cartesian subjective gaze that defines the hegemonic agenda of whiteness in the world presents the person of color as possessing a self-negating embodiment. It is an image in the third person. All around the body reigns an atmosphere of certain uncertainty. To speak of one's body in the third person is to experience the utmost violence to one's existence. Bell Hooks states this succinctly. 
when she reflects on the experience of poverty and shame in the black community within the larger context of social narratives constructed by whiteness. In her words, it is one of the tragic ironies of contemporary life that the privileged classes have convinced the poor and underclass that they must hide and deny the realities of their lives while the privileged go public in therapy, sharing all that they might have repressed out of shame in order to try and heal their wounds." Unquote. In his introduction to the work by Albert Memmi, Jean-Paul Sartre offers a relevant insight worth pursuing. Though his focus is on the relationship that exists between the colonizer and the colonized, they sometimes condition one another and sometimes blend. Oppression means, first of all, the oppressor's hatred for the oppressed. There exists a solitary limit to this venture of destructiveness, and that is colonialism itself. Here, the colonizer encounters a contradiction of his own. Were the colonized to, were the colonized to disappear, so would colonization with the colonizer. There will be no more subproletariat, no more overexploitation. The impossible dehumanization of the oppressed becomes the alienation of the oppressor." Unquote. Sartre sheds light on how the anthropological vision of the oppressed by the agents of oppression define the very existence of the identity that the, the agents of oppression have acquired via the oppressive structures. Consequently, any form of liberation of the oppressed must necessarily lead to the death of the current identities of the oppressor. It must necessarily lead to a double form of liberation, one for the oppressed and the other for the oppressor. Returning to Sartre's conclusion that the liberation of the colonized or oppressed must necessarily lead to the cessation of existence of the form of being brought into existence for the benefactors of the systems of oppression and subjugation, in this case, it must necessarily lead to the end of whiteness as a political, economic, religious, theological, cultural, and epistemological mode of being in the world. Such a cessation creates an opening for a new horizon for us to reimagine the human. In fact, such a horizon must necessarily be eschatological. The human that is encountered in such a new horizon must necessarily reflect the following qualities, in my opinion. Openness to encounter. Openness to a worldview that sees the world and its resources through the lens of surplus and not scarcity. Openness to vulnerability. A consciousness of the relevance of contextual existence that is grounded in an embrace and appreciation of difference. A brief explanation of what these qualities entail is necessary. First, openness to encountering the other in the otherness of their being in the world negates the Cartesian subjective gaze that attempts to bridge the distance between itself and the other while reducing the other to an existence of an object useful to satisfy the needs of the subject and nothing more. To encounter the other is to open oneself to new possibilities. As I have argued in one of my works, and I quote myself, <laughs> yes. I guess, the whole of Christ's life radiates hospitality and friendship. Even the incarnation event is God's gesture of friendship to humanity. By becoming human, Christ has established a fraternal bond with humanity. I use the Second Vatican Council, Guardium et Spes, paragraph 22. In this openness, Christ has made friendship and hospitality necessary tools for expressing the true meaning of Christian identity and witness." Unquote. Furthermore, the new horizon that opens up points to the hypostatic union, one that brings about a God-human union that is grounded in friendship. In the hypostatic union, the notion of alterity is stressed. 
Humanity is invited to embrace a relationship that does not in any way rob us of our characteristics of limitations, mortality, space, time, and finiteness. If authority is at the heart of the God-human identity of Jesus Christ and whose divinized uh, humanity is the gift we are called to participate in via the, Christological, uh, the Christian eschatological hope, it means then that the new humanity that comes forth in the new horizon, where whiteness as a mode of being has been rejected, must necessarily be a humanity that appreciates difference in all its expressions as a mode of being in God's world. To acknowledge the other in their otherness speaks of a worldview that affirms surplus as a way of seeing and relating with the world. Explaining the second quality that the reimagined human ought to possess after the rejection of whiteness as a mode of being in the world, one has to recognize that whiteness is grounded in the idea of scarcity. This scarcity manifests itself in many ways. Anthropological scarcity operates within the context that all persons cannot possess the fullness of authentic humanity because the introduction of race as a core ingredient for being human reduces the number of persons who can lay claim to such a human identity. In the economic realm, capitalism operates with the understanding that there are limited resources that cannot be shared by raw. Consequently, to address this scarcity, laws have to be enacted that allow for the so-called scarce resources to be made available to those who embody authentic humanity. Furthermore, since whiteness is the authentic way of being human in a white conscious world, it is thus logical to argue that authentic knowledge and epistemological traditions of humans in society are produced solely by the white race. Non-white societies and cultures are themselves at the basic level of articulation of information, but never of ideas. A corrective imagination of the human within the context of Christian eschatological hope must necessarily be grounded in the principle of Ubuntu, an African concept. As defined by Michael Battle, and I quote him, the concept of Ubuntu, of necessity, possess, possess a challenge to persons accustomed to thinking of themselves as individuals, unquote. Resolving this hermeneutic crisis that may arise for one unfamiliar with this African principle of being in the world, Archbishop Desmond Tutu states categorically that Ubuntu is the very essence of what it means to be human. To know that you are bound with others in the bundle of life. In our fragile and crowded world, we can survive only together. We can be truly free Ultimately, only together, we can be human only together. Muyaratsi Felix Murove contextualizes this principle within the economic and political spheres of relationship, and by so doing shows how individualism cannot bet forth the type of human that Ubuntu can help us to imagine. In his words, in Ubuntu, the meaning of responsibility is premised on the relationships which the individual has with others in community, and not on the idea of autonomy. One who has Ubuntu takes into consideration the concerns of others in relationship to his or her personal concerns. This claim could not make sense in colonial social evolutionism because of the predominance that was given to individualism and the pursuit of self-interest in human socioeconomic relations. Here, the main scholarly economic and political image of human beings was that their relations were always fueled by greed and that there was no other motivation besides that. The third quality that the reimagined human ought to possess is an embrace of vulnerability as a mode of encountering the other and being in the world of difference. Appropriating Emmanuel Levinas, Levinas's insights, it, I, 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 it entails encountering the other while always resisting the temptation to judge. Being able to be vulnerable helps one to resist the arrogance 
of positioning oneself as the source and focus of meaning. While individualism regards vulnerability as an existential threat, embracing vulnerability opens up a world of relationality. In that world, one begins to see oneself as part of a web of relationships, where one constantly learns and unlearns based on one's experiences in every encounter. Here, I'm intentionally thinking of a cosmological web of relationships that go beyond the anthropocentric vision of the world that has led to current ecological crisis that our world faces. Embracing vulnerability allows for a humanity that looks always beyond itself. It is a humanity that rejects the Cartesian subject, who is the sole determiner of what is meaning. Vulnerability allows for a communal exploration of meaning that speaks to one's context. This leads me to the fourth quality. It is the nature of the experience of whiteness as a mode of being to generalize and make normative that which by its nature is contextually relevant. Notions of law, civility, language, knowledge production, global economic regulations and systems, beauty, and so on are given rigid normativity that validates the worldview created by and for whiteness. Anything that challenges this normative worldview is regarded as a threat. Even in the theological world, the normative form of theology is reserved to Western theology. Other theological traditions are given appendages like Asian, Black, African, Latin, and so on. These appendages already showcase a linguistic marker of something that is added to the norm, a norm that universalizes whiteness. Paying close attention to institutional curricula, one notices how the white experience is given a universal validity, while others must be negotiated. For example, whites are conditioned to think that they are, are cultural. Culture is seen as something exotic or alien. The white experience comes always unchallenged because it is the norm for negotiating the relevance of other experiences. Whiteness is seen as the authentic way of being human. To counter this form of existential positioning of oneself in the world, the eschatological human ought to be one who celebrates their context as a relevant aspect of any discourse on what constitutes their humanity. Abstract discourses of the human that fail to locate the person within a social political context ought to be resisted. James H. Cohn asks the question, and I want to repeat his question. What is the significance of the historical and resurrected Jesus for our times? In response to this question, Cohn resurrects the significance of history and context. The context of Jesus speaks to what identity he has acquired. <coughs> Refusing to acknowledge his context in our Christological deliberations leads to a description of a being that has no relevance in the lives of those who look upon him. Maybe such a process may be relevant to such ideologies Ideologues that tend to universalize their experiences. To refer to Jesus as a man from Galilee is to shed light on a world that reveals many narratives. Consequently, when we imagine the eschatological human as a being living in particular contexts, the historicities defining those contexts must necessarily be part of how we engage that human. Should the context be dehumanizing, then they must necessarily be engaged with the intent to undo the systems and structures of evil defining such contexts. Should such contexts be fruitful, then they can be appropriated by those who inhabit oppressive contexts. Nevertheless, to deny one's context is to speak of a being that is not human. In summary, acknowledging our context always allows us to encounter others in ways that transformative solidarity becomes the goal. I want to tell a story before I transition to the last part of my paper. 
to give you, every theologian speaks from a context, from their location, social location, and all whatever may constitute that location. They might be resisting it, or they might be affirming it. So you might, of recent, I, I was telling Dr. White, that of recent, I think I've become a theologian of uh, the human as a contextual <laughs> being, <laughs> even though my primary research focus is interreligious dialogue. And it's also related, it's not out of context. I'll tell you this story. In 2004, I was a seminarian for the Archdiocese of Los Angeles, though I never became a priest. Uh, and I was preparing, a, we were preparing a liturgical celebration for, to celebrate uh, uh, the Thanksgiving celebration of 2004. I wanted to do something very intercultural, celebrate our cultural uh, differences. We had 68 countries represented in the parish. A lovely a rainbow of identities and countries, United Nations. And so I was supposed to give the homily that day, it's the practice of Archdiocese of Los Angeles under Cardinal Mahoney to have their seminarians give on. So they become good homilies. So people don't run away from the church or sleep while the priest is preaching. So they learn early. It's a good pragmatic approach. So I was vested and with the pastor and we, we, I had my microphone on. I never knew it was on. And then as we were processing into the church, everyone is singing, rejoicing. And the pastor tapped me on my shoulder. I said, hey, Simon, uh, I don't want you to feel alone during this celebration. There were not very many uh, African Americans in the parish. So I put a black icon image of Jesus on the altar. <laughs> Great idea. But do you know what came out from my mouth? Instinctively, I responded by saying, I looked at it, I was like, that's not Jesus. Jesus is not black. Oh. The entire church stopped singing and turned around. <laughs> And voila, it was me, the black guy, who has spent 19 years as at that time preparing people for ROCIA, bringing people to the church, writing about theology, about God, about to be ordained, to become an agent of God's ministry in the world. Yet, in my subconscious, I could not find a place where God identified with me in my blackness. So the question, that was the day I woke up. And then I, I still gave the homily, but it was truth telling time. With tears running down my cheek. Not because I was caught, but because I discovered something. It was a moment of grace, of self discovery. So I began to ask myself, how was I catechized? What type of theology have I been exposed to? That I could not find God identifying with me. If I were to throw a question at you right now and say, do a little exercise, you'll be shocked. I did that at Dr. White's class last night. If I were to ask you to bring out a piece of paper and a pen, or maybe you go home and do this, Mention the word God, and the first image that comes to your mind at that particular moment in your life, draw it. You will be shocked at what you will discover about yourself. Our theologies have been alienating. Not inclusive enough of a God who became human, who became one with creation. That is already the foundation of inclusivity. That all theologies that cannot include everyone cannot birth forth life. God's life for everyone and ought to be rejected. On that note, let me finalize my talk. <laughs> Hope that endures, learning from Reverend Augustus Tolton. The story of Tolton stands as prophetic lamentation of the social scene that has held us captive for too long. To speak of his memory and to accentuate solely his heroism without calling attention to how his fellow Americans and fellow Catholics rejected him because of the color of his skin is to refuse to allow the unsettling power of God's grace to transform us as a nation and as a church. In fact, it is when we actually engage in a critical analysis of systemic racism that continues to play out in the world and the church that we can honestly show reverence for Tolton and it's like 
who answered God's call with rivers of tears and memories of rejection from the institutions they had hoped to serve with joy and fidelity. The work of the church at its basic level is to be the source of God's hope in the world. It is called to usher in the reign of God into all the crevices of our lives in God's world. In light of this reasoning, Van S. Poitras makes the following claim that the large plan for history is that God would dwell with humanity. How are we to understand this claim without letting ourselves escape into the world of abstractions? It points to God's theophany within the context, concrete context of our lives. Such an encounter within the concreteness of our lives demands a response from us, either as individuals, as society, or as church. When we look at our history, secular or ecclesial, can we proudly say that we have responded in a manner that mediates God's life for us and others? I do not think so. The history of slavery, racism, and other forms of discrimination and labels we put on ourselves and on each other prevent us from truly experiencing the fullness of God's presence in our world. The content of the Christian message that the church is mandated to share with all in the world stands as the very source for, of our condemnation insofar as our actions and ways of life as a society do not reflect back what we hope to share with others. While the church in the United States positioned itself as a community of lovers of Christ, Christ who is radically defined by his love for others, its members and itself as an institution failed to live up to what it proclaimed. It was an active participant in the systemic practice of slavery and cultural practice of racial discrimination and segregation. Such an innate paradox places the very Christian faith at the seat of judgment. The question thus arises, can Christianity bring about a new vision of being human in God's world? One cannot find the answer to such a question within the confines of the system that validates such discriminatory practices, secular society and the church itself. One would have to turn to the victims of the system as the place where authentic understanding of the content of the Christian faith lies. Why this turn to the victims, I ask? Perhaps. Noel Leo Eskin's comments can clarify this for us. Reflecting on the realities of the era of plantation churches during slavery in North America, he writes, I quote, the truth is that very few churches indicated any desire to change the system of slavery. The most faithful of churches were involved in the structures of slavery, as they were often beholden to the planter class, and in many cases, the preachers themselves owed slaves. Saving the souls of slaves did not mean changing the system that reduced them to the status of chattel or of making a connection between body and soul. It was felt that if the soul belonged to God, then the body belonged to the master." Unquote. Without missing words, M. Sean Copeland concludes her reflection on U.S. Catholicism with the following, and I quote, In subtle and in crude ways, U.S. Catholicism has and continues to demonstrate contempt for God's black human creatures who share in the glory, beauty, and image of the divine. Such contempt veers toward contempt of the divine, toward blasphemy through enacting, even passively, such metaphysical violence. And such contempt toward black existence could set U.S. Catholicism on the path of idolatry. Unquote. Again, one cannot appreciate the life and ministry of Tolton unless one locates it within these difficult narratives of our secular and ecclesial histories. To respond to the voice of God, he had to leave his own country and become a pilgrim in a foreign land. Thanks to the discerning eyes of Reverend Peter McGurr, an Irish immigrant himself whose family fled the potato farming of 1845 to 18, 1849, Tolton was able to be guided and supported in his desire to become a priest. Labels have ways 
of defining us and putting us in moments of history that may or may not always bring out the best memories of the times. Totin has always been remembered as the first black, Negro, or African-American priest in the United States. My focus here is not whether the adjective first is historically accurate or not. I prefer to leave that to church historians to decide. I am not one, and neither do I pretend to be one. <coughs> but I am particularly interested in the racial adjectives that have become a stubborn appendage defining who he is within the larger history of the United States of America. To speak black is to speak a certain form of history, one that has multiple layers. In a country coming out of a civil war that was fought over slavery, black may or may not always be an identity marker everyone rejoices over. In a society that has stubbornly resisted the call to abandon its racist tendencies and consciousness, black is most often a burdened identity to identify with. Yet, Totin's blackness that is defined radically by his Christian faith becomes the possibility for reimagining how to be human in the United States of America. Sabrina A. Penn sheds light on this thought when she writes, through Tolton, all men saw how a former slave could become educated and become a beacon for his race and to exemplify to all people that a black man is equal to a white man and able to become a civilized American citizen, unquote. Please do know that when I say, I, I always love to be inclusive, but I'm always being faithful to the quotation. Yeah. Man, man, not my thing. The hope that Totin offers Catholicism in the United States of America is also the horizon for lamentation. Totin's story reveals how the church did and continues to fail to live up to its moral ideals. A church that is held captive by the social ills of society may not be able to embrace its transformative and prophetic stance in the face of such evils. Where the church in America has failed in its duties to be the voice advocating for a holistic humanity for its all persons, the life and ministry of Totin offers a corrective vision. Totin reminds us that another way of being a Christian is possible if we focus on the ideals of our Christian faith. Penn recounts the story of how Totin met his family's former slave owner, Mr. S Stephen Elliott, who Having heard Totin preach at Mass, came up to Totin after the liturgy to reveal his identity and to ask for forgiveness for his role in the systemic evil he had actively participated in. To forgive is to shed light on evil, and by so doing, remove all veils of secrecy that evil needs in order to function. By forgiving his family's former slave owner, Tolton was calling attention to America's original sin. By patiently suffering all the indignities to his person in a racialized America, Tolton was speaking prophetically of a new way of being American, a new way of being a Catholic, and above all else, a new way of being human in God's world. In conclusion, Tolton's story reminds us that the last world on the black experience will not be defined by the lynching tree or systems of erasure that put in place in society to, that are put in place in society to favor whiteness. Just as the cross points to the victory of Christ, realizing the ever unfolding gift of the resurrection, so also does the life of Tolton. Tolton's life is a statement on the ever revealing horizon of new imaginations that occur when we take seriously the content of Christ's ministry to become a source of life for all in an abundant manner. To appreciate this new horizon, all must reject their old ways of being in the world. As did Eliot, who approached the altar and pleaded with Totin for forgiveness. Paul Penn tells us of the response of Totin to Eliot's request for forgiveness, and I quote, I assure you, you were forgiven a long time ago. 
We are told that Eliot asked for baptism and was baptized by Totin. How salvific is the gesture? A descendant of slaves who were Christianized primarily to subjugate them becomes the agent of salvation for a descendant of those whose ancestors used Christianity as a tool for subjugating others. The eschatological life is a life that is translogical. It points to the drama of salvation that makes possible God's grace for all persons, victims, or victimizers. Thank you.